Death on the Western Front was a frail barrier that men crossed, smiling and gallant, every day. They had seen so much of death that life mattered less than the moments of being alive. In the wake of the war, the quest for Everest became a mission of regeneration for a people in a nation bled white by war. Everything um, you know of your life, every sense you have of the modern, every intuition, every doubt you've ever experienced, was actually born in the mud and blood of Flanders. A single bullet fired in the summer of 1914 to the breast of a prince in Sarajevo shattered a universe. For a century, Europe had been at peace, even as industrial miracles created wealth and power beyond anything that had ever been known. And like children at a birthday party anticipating cake, the European powers sliced into pieces and consumed the confection of a planet. Each took what it could until the boundaries of imperial ambitions tightened like a noose around the neck of civilization. And then a single shot fired in Sarajevo sparked the greatest cataclysm in the history of humanity. The Second World War, more familiar to Americans, was but the child of the first. Winston Churchill famously fused the two conflicts in what he referred to as the Thirty Years' War. Never was there a war less necessary to fight, he said, than the first, or more essential to win than the second. So everything begins with the Great War of 1914 to 1918, including this story tonight, for the war forms the melancholic backdrop to the first attempts to climb Mount Everest. For that entire generation of men who had been through the nightmare of the war, death held no mysteries. They had seen so much of it that it had nothing left to teach them. And I had the sense that for these men of Flanders, life mattered less than the moments of being alive. And so on Everest, they were prepared to accept a level of risk that would have been unimaginable before the war. So I set out with that idea in mind to find out if these men, how these men, had encountered the war. The British zone of operations was surprisingly small, roughly the size of the English county of Lincolnshire. The British war front was never longer than 125 miles. For much of the war, it was only 85 miles long. But behind that front, the British built 6,000 miles of trenches, 6,000 miles of railroad. And because the zone of operations was so small, and because so many millions of men moved through it, and because in the wake of the war 10 years after, famously a tsunami of books were published, you could literally go into the archives, as I did over the course of 10 years, 60 different archives around the world, mostly, of course, in Britain, and find out where every single man had been every day of the Great War. Just consider this. At the beginning of the war, you had to stand five foot eight to be able to enlist. Within two months, that had dropped to five foot three, and any man who could walk was eagerly recruited into the British Army. Each month, the British Army required 10,000 new junior officers just to replace the numbers of the dead. The Royal Army Medical Corps during the war needed, of course, 108 million battle dressings, but it also needed 22,386 artificial eyes. The impact on Britain was so severe, a million dead, 2.5 million wounded. In the wake of the war, 40,000 amputees, 60,000 men without sight, 65,000 soldiers who never returned from the twilight memory of hell that was shell shock. Sociologically, the agony of the war had been such that in the first year of peace, half of British land changed hands, more than had ever changed hands since the Norman conquest. And so if the quest for Mount Everest before the war began as a kind of a gesture of redemption for an empire of explorers who had lost the race to the North and South Poles and had embraced this coveted third pole that lay within the domain of the Raj, in the wake of the war, the quest for Everest became a mission of regeneration for a people in a nation bled white by war. 26 men attempted Everest in 1921, 22, and 24. 
Some had missed the war, but 20 most assuredly had to see in the war, the very worst of it. John Noel, who went to his death speaking incessantly about his contributions to the Western Front, when in fact he quivered in suicidal despair through most of the war in a hospital shattered by shell shock. Howard Somerville, I have his medical documents, he would perform in any one given day 10 to 12 major surgeries as he raced to try to save the dying. Jeffrey Winthrop Young, arguably the greatest climber of his era, the mentor, of course, of Mallory, had been at Yeep in April of 1915 when the Germans attacked for the first time using poison gas, and this is what he wrote in his journal. This horror was too monstrous to believe at first, but when it came, far as we had traveled from our civilized world of a few months back, the savagery of it, of the sight of men choking to death with yellow froth lying on the floor and out on the fields, made me rage with an anger that no later cruelty of man, not even the degradation of our kind by the hideous concentration camps in later Germany, ever quite rekindled. For then, we still thought all men were human. When it came time to actually equip the Everest expeditions, the great climber Tom Longstaff laconically remarked, the supply of young climbers is not exactly what it was before the war. So if the war informed and haunted the lives of all these men, the expeditions themselves in 21, 22, and 24 were not isolated adventures, but rather imperial gestures woven from the start into the fabric of the Raj. You know, India was a British creation. 1,300 Englishmen in the Indian civil service, not a single Indian, because Lord Curzon famously said there was not one in the entire subcontinent up to the job. 1,300 Englishmen dominating fully a fifth of humanity. And the British had indeed transformed the face of India, but India itself was a British invention, an imagined place brought into reality by the by the mathematicians and the technicians of the survey of India. Maps were the very key to the notion of India. They codified the features of the subcontinent, even as they created the rationale for occupation. And so it was not by chance that the greatest scientific experiment of the 19th century was a literal measurement of India. And it was through that process of the great trigonomical survey that the greatest mountain of the world would be found. But the British at that point, in the immediate wake of the India mutiny, were not concerned with, with mountaineering, but they were concerned with the unknown lands that lay beyond the Himalaya. Knowledge was the key to British power, and it was intolerable to a man like Lord Curzon that he had no way of communicating with the capital of Tibet that lay but 250 miles north of Darjeeling, an ag agricultural enclave that exported tea to every hamlet in the British Empire. And so this idea of finding out what was beyond uh, slipped into paranoia and a fear that the great enemy of Britain in the 19th century, which was not France and not Germany, but was Russia. The Russian Empire throughout the 19th century expanded by an average of 55 square miles every day of the 19th century, bringing it to the very gates of the Raj. So the fear of the British was not that they should be taking Tibet, but rather the Russians might take it from them. And this provoked a series of incursions led eventually by Sir Francis Young Husband, where the, the virginity of the mystic center of, of Tibet, the capital of Lhasa, was finally broken by this imperial force that invaded in 1904. It disappointed the British in so many ways. And as the expedition retreated to Darjeeling, Young Husband, who was both saint, mystic visionary, and spy, had to find another place to fire the British imagination, the imperial venture. And he saw from Campazong this extraordinary mountain hovering over the universe. And this was Everest. And so even as the British are beginning this sort of mission towards Everest, it is never separate from imperial thrust and parry. Within a month of the end of the war, Young Husband was scheming to get British boys to the base of Everest. And then the question became, who's going to go on this expedition? 
These are the men who went to Everest in 1921. Now, it's hard to believe from the rather mousy appearance who these men are. Sandy Wollaston on the left, George Mallory, Guy Bullock, the diplomat, the governor of Bengal, this remarkable Charles Howard Burry, and the irascible Scott Harold Rayburn. Let's take Charles Howard Burry over there. This was an incredible guy who led the 1921 expedition. He was not really a man designed for war, but he saw the war from start to finish. He was always drawn to the sacred. He read the works of Krishnamurti. He was enamored of Cahil Gibran. He was a brilliant writer, a great naturalist. He spoke 27 Asian and European languages. He was not a man prepared for war, but when war broke out, he fought in every engagement. He was a ward of Lord Lansdowne. He finally almost went mad on one night in the shadow of the Somme when he was given the order to dig a communication trench to a place the British soldiers called the Devil's Wood. As the artillery flashed, the very lights, he suddenly found that all of them were literally digging not through soil, but through rotten flesh, six and eight feet deep. What you forget about the war is two things, and this is why the book's called Into the Silence, the noise. Napoleon fired 20,000 shells at Waterloo. At the Somme, the British had 1,600 artillery pieces which could fire 1,000 shells a day. The sound was palatable, it was visible. It, it, you could feel it in the air. So it was Howard Burry who eventually led the 1921 expedition. So what they did is they followed, and again in this sort of spirit that I suggested, that the efforts on Everest had everything to do about the imperial desire. It was not a coincidence that the first expeditions to the heart of Everest literally followed in the wake of the of the military invasion of Young Husband. And in fact, this is a deeper thing. When we use that language, as the early expeditions never did, we attack a mountain, we assault a mountain, the language of war. That wasn't really accidental because, of course, these climbers were literally advancing into the Karakoram, the Hindu Kush, or the Himalaya in the wake of pacification expeditions of the British Army. So the expedition you know, began in Darjeeling, going up the Sitsa River, up to Jalapla, and, uh, of course, uh, Henry Moore's head in 1921, the surveyor, went strictly to the Serpola to rendezvous at Campazong. The main thrust of the expedition went up the Shumbi, uh, Jalapla into the Shumbi Valley. There's a verdant tongue of Tibet that drops down up to the miserable town of Ferry, across the Tangla, and then instead of continuing on to Gyantse and the royal route to um, Lhasa, they went off the map, turning to the west on this great arc that took them to Campazong and eventually to the shining crystal monastery of Shegar and on to Tingri that became their base. Now, on that approach march, something really strange happened. Arthur Kellis, the legendary high altitude physiologist, the man who knew more about the Himalaya than anyone engaged in the adventure, simply died of exhaustion and was buried at Campazong. This is his gravesite within the shadow of three peaks that he was the first to climb. Now, 1921 was less a mountaineering expedition than a geographical expedition. Uh, the, the, the purpose of the expedition was to map the landscape, to find the chink in the armor of the mountain so that a mountaineering expedition the subsequent year could find its way to the top, and meanwhile do geological surveys um, uh, uh, botanical collections, basically the old time natural history exploration of, of a landscape. And of course, with the surveyors seconded to the expedition from the Survey of India to map the land and fill in the blanks on the map in this part of Tibet that the Europeans had never been to. So as they finally found their way to Tingri, their mission was not simply to find a route up the mountain, but to explore all the country, including the mystic realm of Lapche, homeland of Milarepa, the uh, mystic saint of Tibet, uh, the Nangpala, the pass that reaches over here into Nepal. So they got to the Rongbuk Monastery, and in Everest lore, people always say that this monastery has been there for thousands of years. It was actually built in the early 1900s by a remarkable Lama, Zatrul Rinpoche. And one of the things that I did in this book was tell the story from the Tibetan side, and one of the ways that I did it was to go and live months in the monastery of his spiritual heir, Tulsi Rinpoche, at the Tupten Sholin Monastery in Nepal. But I also got hold of the spiritual autobiography of Zatrul Rinpoche, 
Rinpoche, the Namtar, and had it translated in its entirety for the first time by monks in Kathmandu. And this is Mallory's camp in the heart of the Gama Valley, in the heart of the Buddha field. Now, Mallory foolishly twice missed the key to the mountain. The key to the mountain was the North Coal. They couldn't approach it from the west. They had to get there from the other side. And he missed the opening to the East Rombok Glacier. Oliver Wheeler did not. He mapped it. He sent the map to Howard Burry saying this is exactly how to get there. Unfortunately, in 1921, by then it was too late. The entire momentum of the expedition had moved to the eastern face, and there they began a series of thrusts up the Carta Valley, up the Gamma Valley, eventually getting to this extraordinary place, the Lakpala, Windy Gap, where they established a camp and finally could see the coal of their desires. This was the North Coal, seen from the East Rongbuk Glacier. This side could be climbed, and if you simply went up here, you avoided all this carnage of the Northeast Ridge, and you came out on the height of the Northeast Ridge with only two apparent obstacles, which famously became known as the first and second steps. Mallory, who disdained Canadians and at every opportunity um, was disparaging to Wheeler, and he never even acknowledged um, that Wheeler had found the key to the mountain. In fact, he famously lied twice in a letter to his beloved Ruth, saying that as he stood on Windy Gap, if only we knew where the East Rongbuk ended up. Well, of course, he did know because Wheeler's map a week before had told him precisely. But when it did come time to climb the North Coal, when in doubt, who do you turn to? A Canadian. <laughs> and so who are the three men who braved the North Coal? Guy Bullock, George Mallory, and Oliver Wheeler. When they got up, they both estimated their time from their base camp to be hours apart. And it was no wonder, for what they found at the coal shattered their senses. Neither had ever experienced a wind like that. Wheeler thought he was going to die. The only way he survived, he said, was to shut his mind and remember how he had survived the artillery barrages at the front by breathing deeply and bringing himself into another reality, even as the world fell apart around him. And that's how they encountered what would in time become but a first step in the ladder to the summit. So having discovered the key to the mountain, they retreated to England. And then in 1922, they went out again. All of these expeditions had the members shifting around, and every expedition had men more remarkable than the last. Here's John Morris, a transport officer in 1922. He was a delicate boy, never wanted to fight in the war. He was a lover of music. When he went off to the front, he tried to lose his virginity to a Nottingham prostitute. He fled from her room, having not shed his trousers, but nevertheless was certain that he'd contracted some foul disease. Uh, he was almost blind with those bifocals, but in the trenches he never failed to kill. What finally saved him was his ability, three years into the fighting, to join the Indian Army. That led him to the Northwest Frontier, and not two months before he joined the expedition in 1922, his party was ambushed. He fought his way through. Most of his men were killed. One month later, he was at the Everest Hotel, alone, contemplating the upcoming expedition, when this man, like a bull, blasted into the room, almost unhinging the doors. And this was, of course, the legendary Charles Bruce, the mad mountain maniac who would lead the 1922 expedition. An extraordinary figure. His favorite party trick was to tear a pack of cards in half. At Gallipoli, machine gun fire had literally severed his legs, and he was told, after those two dreadful wounds, to retire to England and, above all, have a relaxed life and never walk uphill. Instead, he set off for Everest. <laughs> they found their way to Shegar Zong, the Shining Crystal Monastery, the extraordinary 1922 expedition. And now, of course, we do have the two great climbers, George Mallory and George Finch. He couldn't be denied. And George Finch had a secret up his sleeve, and that, of course, was oxygen. He was a fantastic chemist, a scientist, and he was a master of this unknown art of the oxygen technology. They moved their way toward the mountain. 
Here they are. And then a dreadful thing happened. Just as Finch was about to climb, he fell ill. And in a kind of foolish, spontaneous gesture, Colonel Strutt, the two I see on the expedition, authorized Mallory, Colonel Norton, Mooreshead, and Somerville to climb for the best climbers a single shot without oxygen. They, of course, failed miserably. Returned, you can see Mooreshead lost his fingers, Norton his ear, Mallory was injured, only Somerville emerged unscathed, leaving George Finch with only one man to climb with, the cousin of General Bruce, who had never been on a mountain before. But using oxygen, George Finch set a height record of 27,300 feet. And had he not hesitated to save the life of Jeffrey Bruce, it's quite possible that in 1922, Finch would have reached the top of Everest. And of course, when he had to retreat, having saved Bruce, the expedition should have slipped away from the mountain. But Mallory by now was a man possessed. He insisted on a final assault, and this is when tragedy struck. This photograph was taken an hour before these seven men would be swept away to their death by the avalanche that colored the uh, end of the second expedition. 1924, a new team, and at this point, a desperate team. They have, of course, added to the expedition two remarkable men, Noel O'Dell, who would be the last to see Mallory and Irvin alive, and Sandy Irvin himself, this remarkable young athlete of 22 from Oxford. And the inclusion of Irvin, given the fate that awaited him, has always provoked controversy. But in fact, he was a perfect choice. He was a mechanical savant who could replace Finch, who, for various reasons, had been excluded from this expedition. He was ferociously strong. He had, in fact, climbed mountains in Spitsbergen and with Odell. Strength counted for more than technical prowess on Everest. And this is no Odell, the last to see Mallory alive. And the question as to what happened on that fateful day of June 8th is something that probably we'll never know, and maybe we shouldn't ever know. Um, the quest to find the camera, to prove that these guys got up the top of the mountain, has taken on a kind of carnival atmosphere that, to my mind, seems almost unseemly. When they did know that Mallory had died, General Colonel Norton famously wrote, we were a sad little party, but from the first we accepted the loss of our comrades in that rational spirit which all of our generation had learned in the Great War. And there was never any tendency to a morbid harping on the irrevocable. But the tragedy was very near. And so, as constantly in the war, so too in our mimic campaign, death had taken his toll from the very best. On the very night that they retreated from the mountain, certain now that Mallory and Irvin were dead, one of the men camped out high above the Zakarchu, the last glimpse back at the theatrical canvas of the north face of Everest, which had so captured their imagination. This is what he wrote in his diary. I could see the whole of the historic ground, the scene of the protracted adventure spread out like a map and bathed in soft, full moonlight. That night, and with that scene in front of me, it was quite easy to realize that the price of life is death and that so long as the payment be made promptly, it matters little to the individual when the payment is made. Somewhere up there in that vast wilderness of ice and rock were two still forms. Yesterday, with all the vigor and will of perfect manhood, they were playing a great game, their life's desire. Today it is over and they had gone without their ever knowing the beginnings of decay. Could any man desire a better end? Did he reach it or not? If you read the ocular testimony of Conrad Anker, this remarkable climber who both found Mallory's body and then retraced the route up the North Coal, examining the possibility of the first step and the second step, it seems quite unlikely for any number of reasons that George Mallory reached the top simply, if only, because of the severity of the second step. But there was always that one possibility that keeps the story alive. 
had the snows that so buffeted the North Coal and, and, and the head of the East Rumbuck Glacier, forcing Colonel Norton to retreat not once but three times from his assault on the mountain, had those snows accumulated in the Northeast Ridge with the same depth that they accumulated at the head of the glacier, it's quite possible that a cone of snow f formed on the base of the second step essentially eliminating it as a hazard, as indeed did occur in the fall of 1985. Had that happened, Mallory and Irvin could have walked up the second step with the same speed and ease with which Noel O'Dell famously reported that they uh, appeared to be doing. And had he surmounted the second step, absolutely nothing would have kept George Mallory from walking to the summit of Everest. Because for all of these men, life had become something new. Billy Grenville, who tried to explain the reality of the Western Front to his father, Billy who would die, his brother too would die. But before he died, he wrote to his father and he said, death on the Western Front was a frail barrier that men crossed smiling and gallant every day. They had seen so much of death that life mattered less than the moments of being alive. And had Mallory overcome the impediment of the second step, there was nothing that would have kept him from reaching the heights of Everest. And in many ways, whether he did or not, in my mind, Everest will always be George Mallory. George Mallory was a man that no one could keep up with on the mountain. Mallory was a man who created the legend of Everest, and Everest created the legend of Mallory. And the story will be an epic one for all time. Thank you very much.